Hello everybody, welcome back to the Stat Dose podcast. We're here today doing an episode on how to approach the sick child. With caution. And courage. And yes. competency. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how far we get. <laughs> We're going to discuss uh, basically how you approach the child, talk through an A to E response, a little bit about history and a few little uh, tips and tricks to hopefully improve your practice. <laughs> Children, they are quite scary. I'd say it's scary for the child, it's scary for the parents, and it's quite scary for the health professionals who are looking after them as well. They could be crying, screaming, kicking, or they might even be completely silent, which is actually, I think, a lot more scary if they're silent, withdrawn, or drowsy. Um, Either way, a sick child is probably going to fill you with dread. And that's why it's sensible to have a systematic approach to assessing the sick child to guide you through and make sure you don't miss anything. Liz, let's have a little think about a history we might want to get, first of all, from our patient, and then we'll look more at the ACE approach. Okay, well, I think you want to get your history from as many sources as you can. So if you can get history from the child, then that is fantastic. If not, then their parents, perhaps a GP, um, paramedic, triage nurse, anywhere that anyone who's got some information for you. And you're looking at their symptoms, the duration, the progression of those symptoms. Has it happened very quickly or over a longer period of time? How long have they been unwell? Are they getting better or worse? You're also wondering, have they got any unwell contacts, other family members um, with similar symptoms, or is it just that child? Really important, looking at their input and output. Are they feeding and are they toileting? For example, have they been having wet nappies? In infants, you want a urine output of about two mils per kilogram per hour, um, or in older children, one mil per kg per hour. Anything less than that indicates inadequate renal perfusion. So if you're judging it by wet nappies, you might say, actually, if a child hasn't had a wet nappy for 12 hours, that's a real red flag for you. And also, you're going to be looking at their behaviour a little bit like Emma said at the beginning. Are they playful and interactive, or are they really withdrawn, very quiet? It's important to gain their birth history, their gestation, any antenatal or postnatal complications that they may have had, any comorbidities that they may have at their young age already, their growth and development, have they been reaching any milestones, and what's their current rate, looking at their growth charts, are they within their centiles or are they deviating from their centiles, um, either gaining too much weight or losing too much weight. Also relevant is their immunisation status, particularly if they're coming in with any um, infective symptoms. And obviously don't miss out any medications. Some children are on a lot of medications already. Really, really important with kids is gauging the parental concern. That can be a real red flag for you. So That's great. Yeah, I would agree. Um, what you say about the parents' concern definitely being a red flag because the parents generally do know their children best and they'll know if their behaviour has changed. If you're able to ask the child to gain their pain score, there's the Warm Baker Faces Pain Rating School, which we often use with children, which is a really good pictorial guide that they don't have to explain to you that they're really happy or really sad. They can just point to this face. Helen, what do you think in terms of our sort of end of the bed what would we look at with the patient to begin with? So when you stood at the end of the bed, so I'll say hello and be approachable and happy with the child because you're not, too, you're not dealing with an adult. So remember your audience. Be aware of parents, where they are, and how their anxiety levels may be. But literally, at the end of the bed, you come in, you can clock the child, look at them, see their colour. You can see whether they're having any difficulty breathing, see if they're alert. ASPU is really helpful in this, because I'm often assessing patients' GCS is difficult, but an ASPU is really quick at the end of the bedogram. You can see if they're active and playing, as we've already mentioned, or if they're drowsy and lethargic or obtunded. So if they've changed their conscious state, um, I love that word, obtunded, well, to place them into whether they're well, whether they're compensating peri-arrest or a decompensated state. So if you've got someone peri-arrest or decompensated state, call for help immediately. Don't hang them out. Always err on the side of caution with a child. Never be, never be afraid to escalate a sick child. You never get told off. We, you know, we talk about it in sin quite a lot, don't we? Risks and benefits of escalating yeah. um, early and actually, certainly with children, escalating them early if it's you know inappropriately averted commas, all you end up doing is sending a senior away. You see, it comes and has mm-hmm. a look at that patient and goes, Actually, they're okay. I 
creative leader. If you don't escalate, that never happens. You might miss the, the sick child. So definitely have a low threshold mm-hmm. to escalate. And that's because um, children compensate really well mm-hmm. for a long time, don't they? And then they suddenly deteriorate. And you don't have that slow deterioration. You yeah. have to get with adults. Exactly, yeah. So be, as you say, the elderly will generally slowly mm-hmm. deteriorate over a period of time. Kids don't. So actually, some of the early features might not be that early as well. That's the other thing yeah. to, to know. You know, if they're, if they're tachycardic, actually, that's probably a sign of shock. Yes. Um, whereas adults might drop their blood pressure, kids won't, which they'll maintain mm. until to the very end. So, yeah, good point. Mm. Always be aware of safeguarding as well. Mm. Make sure that if you have got any concerns, you raise them with a senior colleague and get help and never be afraid to make a safeguarding referral if you are concerned. Because normally, if your gut feeling is there's an issue, there often is. Matt, you love A to E. Can you kick us off? Tell us about A and a child. So A obviously stands for airway. So the important thing to note with children is that their airways are of different size. Their anatomy is different to to adults. You've probably covered in in sort of BLS type teaching that certainly little kids have very large heads, very short necks. So we generally maintain a neutral head position as opposed to the older child where you go for the the traditional head tilt, chin lift type approach to improve their, their airway. So one of the most important questions we obviously need to ask ourselves when thinking about airways is, is, is it obstructed? Now, we won't go through all the, all the signs that you're going to find, but obviously if that patient isn't breathing, if they're, if they're collapsed, if there's no air movement at all, you're going to be crash bell. You want to see any people there dramatically, um, quickly, dramatically. Dramatically. Quite dramatically. dramatically. That sounds good. I don't know why I said that, but I said it's dramatic. Really. Yeah. It? I'm, I'm glad I did say dramatic because I think it sounds better, doesn't it? Obviously, you've got an obstructed airway, you know, rapid uh, rapid escalation you want senior people there quickly um if you've got any airway concern at all though you also want senior people there quickly one of the big sort of airway conditions that we that you'll come across is croup where you get that sort of bark like cough you often get quite a lot of stridor as well and actually if it's the first time you've heard it you're probably going to be a little bit distressed and concerned and it's entirely appropriate to escalate that that child to pediatrics to, to anesthetics whoever so don't be afraid to do that. In reality, they just often just need a bit of dexamethasone just to reduce that airway swelling. It works very quickly, and it's really good. I remember the first time I saw it as an F1, how rapidly that, that as, as Helen said, how rapidly that child got better as well from being so a child with strider with an airway problem, an imminent airway problem, suddenly getting really well, really happy, running around like that mad thing. Steroids are amazing. Steroids are amazing. Love One of the key things that we advise people to do is not to examine the throat. And so don't try and stick a tongue depressor down or anything like that. If you're worried about the airway, you can essentially trigger other issues, i.e. lewin being the worst thing you can trigger, which will make that bad situation much worse. So just escalate care early. You need to be thinking about, is there a foreign body? Is there any vomit or anything like that that's sort of obstructing the airway? Or is it something like epiglottitis? So again, going back to our history, have they been immunized uh, against against HIV? There are some airway adjuncts that we can use. Actually, I don't think it'd be helpful to talk about that because the, the main learning point you should take away is if you've got an airway problem, escalate. As an airway problem is actually quite uncommon, though, to be fair. The majority of children you see won't have airway problems. I'd say the majority of children probably have breathing problems, don't they? So if we go on to our B, is our child struggling to breathe? Very important that we assess the respiratory rate early. Now, remember that there's different ranges for children, so it's quite handy to have a little card maybe and tucked in between your ID badge that you can refer to the normal ranges for children's respiratory rates, heart rates, and blood pressures. Next, you'd want to kind of think about looking for signs of respiratory distress. So again, these are quite common things that you might see in children, things like grunting. No, that's not a very good grunt. <laughs> so, Have so, a pig's here if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so grunting, um, accessory muscle use. Nasal flaring, or well, can we add a picture of some good nasal flaring? Yeah, if, you're, if you're watching YouTube, I'll try and stick as many pictures as possible of the, all these lovely signs. Lovely. Head bobbing. Intercostal. <laughs> I love that you paused to do a head bob, <laughs> even though we're doing a podcast. <laughs> Intercostal, or external or subcostal recession. And you might see seesaw respiration, uh, which is this paradoxical movement of the abdomen during inspiration where the abdomen expands and the thorax retracts as the diaphragm contracts. Again, I'm trying to display. And then next, thinking about measuring chest expansion and checking out uh, oxygen saturation. So hopefully you've got a really helpful nurse on hand who's been able to get those sats on for you. Also, don't forget that you do have a stethoscope, so you can use it. Auscultate that chest. Um, Try and warm it at first, because children will often start screaming if you put a freezing cold stethoscope on their chest. Try and get the child to be nice and settled. And trying maybe using distraction techniques, whether that's the 
play specialists or the parents so that they can kind of stay distracted while you're having a listen. Beware a silent chest. This is a medical emergency. And then obviously other abnormal sounds you might hear on the chest would be things like a wheeze, an asthma, or perhaps crepitations or something like bronchitis. I completely agree with, with, with all of that. I think we, we should probably reinforce the point that actually the, one of the worst things you can do when seeing any child is distress them. Mm. So actually you know, getting a SATS probe on sounds quite simple, but actually to a lot of kids it's very distressing and they don't like it and they don't know what it is. Um, sometimes you subtly put it on the toe and it looks like over the toe so they don't see it. I like to make the SATS probe a crocodile actually and that's mm. how you should go and it becomes part of the fun mm. and then they don't mind it as much as if you just say pop this on the finger. Equally, exactly the same with the stethoscope. I, every time I use a stethoscope with a child, I always start at the feet and then I do a little game. I go bum, 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 up by the knees, into the thigh, into the abdomen, then onto the chest. Into the thigh? Yeah, so just place it on the thigh, just so they get used to it being a thing that isn't going to hurt them. Um, well, you can get little cuddly toys on your stethoscope as well. Kids often yeah. quite like those. As, we, as I said, there's so much information you can get from just observing that child. How are they playing? Having a look at their breathing, get them stripped off. Don't naturally jump for the stethoscope, which I think is what a lot of us do with adults. We naturally go, well, it's a chest problem. I'm a doctor, but I'm very important. But actually, we gain so much more information from, from watching. watching. It's almost playing with the child to gain the information mm. that he wants to do. Absolutely. Trusting your clinical judgment for making those clinical observations without the machines. Mm. And I think that goes in all medicine. Just because the machine's telling you something doesn't necessarily mean that the machine's correct. Moving on to circulation, I think really important, just looking at your skin colour, you know, are they pink or pale? Often they'll be more of a blue or mottled colour when they're really sick. And for the heart rate things, again, know your normal values so that you can recognise the abnormal values for them. When you're checking their pulse um, for an infant, you're checking the femoral or brachial pulse. For a child, you're checking the radial pulse. Don't forget to check your capillary roof full time, um, both on the sternum and peripherally. Blood pressure, likewise, with your pulse. Know your normals for their age range. Children tend to compensate, like we said, for a long time. So once you get an alteration in those, those are quite late signs. Children tend to be tachycardic. And that can be caused by all sorts of things, you know, whether that's their pain or their stress and anxiety just from being examined. It could be sepsis or hypoxia. But just beware that prolonged or severe hypoxia ultimately leads to bradycardia and um, diminishing central pulses. That is bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Liz. That is bad. That's really bad. You know, that's the terminal signs. So... So you want to have called your seniors before you get to that stage. You oh, want to yeah. have called them while they're still tachycardic rather than waiting. The key one is before, isn't it? You don't want yeah. them to turn up yeah. to... Cause once, yeah, right child, exactly. Yeah. Once kids get below a heart rate of... of well, it's only infants, below a heart rate of 60, you should be starting chest compressions yeah. to maintain the cardiac output. You don't want to be calling for help whilst doing chest compressions. Yeah. You want everyone there already. The most common cause of circulatory failure in children is... Um, Hypovolemia, whether that's bleeding or very commonly it's severe diarrhea and vomiting. Sepsis and anaphylaxis likewise can cause um, hypovolemia. The indicators for clinical dehydration and end organ perfusion status. Like we said earlier, looking for decreased urine output, looking for dry mucous membranes. What's their skin turbulence like? Is that decreased? Are they tachypneic? And have they got altered conscious levels? Um, so don't forget, get that IV or intraosseous access in early. Consider a fluid bolus of 10 mils per kilogram and make sure you've got that urgent senior input. So we, we used to give 20 mils per, per kilo and that's changed in the most recent uh, APLS guidelines. So we're now actually giving every child 10 mils per kilo. So D is for disability. What is the child's neurological state? Assess AVPU score again. Often AVPU is much more um, easily gained on a child than a GCS. And just a reminder as well, on your AVPU score, what it actually equates to. Um, so the P um, on your AVPU equates to a GCS of less than 8. Escalate. I'm a big fan of, of GCS um, in, in, in adults. In kids, I much prefer AVPU because, I mean, there are paediatric GCSs, but they're just complicated. Actually, I don't think they add that much, realistically. If a kid's got a reduced GCS, that's a patient who's going to be seen by, by some yeah. senior people. And you're going to be considering things like CT scans, anti-epileptics, depending on the clinical, clinical scenario. So actually, the actual number, whether it's GCS of 10 or GCS of 8, doesn't really impact on that decision-making. So use the AVPU. Assess pupillary response to light. Make sure you assess their limb tone and movement. Seriously, your child's 
child, 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 <laughs> children <laughs> tend to be hypertonic and floppy, quiet, withdrawn. That's not normal for most children. They might have a bulging fontanel. They might have focal neurological signs. So just make sure you've assessed everything. And glucose. Don't forget the blood glucose level. <laughs> I say the bloody glucose. <laughs> <laughs> and temperature. Or you can have that in exposure. So then you get E for exposure. Have you expose them? Examine them from top to toe. Down temperature. Look for any rashes. You know, you've got a child at the end of the day who could have chicken box, could have an allergic reaction, they might have one through nettles, who knows? <laughs> well, allergic rashes are really important. You know, you don't want to miss something like meningococcal septicemia or ITP or HSP. Yeah, everyone gets worried about meningococcal sepsis. There are, if you, for good reason. For good reason, absolutely. If you've done a proper A to E, you would be concerned about that prior to getting to E, would be the point I'd make. So actually, by the stage that they've got that non-blanching rash... That's the septicemia bit, I ate there. You should have noticed he's got a really exactly. sick child that, that before you notice the rest. That is going to be unwell, pyrexic, tachycardic child who's working, who's got respiratory distress because they're trying to get more oxygen around. Parents get very worried, rightly, again, about the non-blanching rashes. But actually, if you follow your atory properly, that should be on your radar before. Um, a few little spots in a well child, it's not going to be meningococcal sepsis, it's going to be ITP, it's going to be potentially some early bruising, it's going to be something different. Um, marker pen. Marker pen, marker pen. <laughs> <laughs> Often it is, right? <laughs> Don't forget to look for any bruises as well, or any yeah. other sort of evidence of an accidental injury. Particularly in, in the, uh, the location and the age of the child. Kids generally, so rolling off the bed is the classic, that's generally around sort of six to eight months. Um, when your kids start to be able to roll, the best way to check if a child can roll is to lay them on the bed and see if they roll. If they don't roll and they've got bruising, you need to be worried about an accidental injury. Equally, if they're getting bruising in unusual locations. So toddlers fall a lot. That's okay. We know they're going to fall. They're going to get bruising to their knees, to their lower legs, possibly to their hands. They're not going to get bruising on their upper arms or torso, or particularly around sort of nappy areas and things. So again, sight is important uh, when, you're, when you're checking, and that's why it's important to, to strip these, these kids off. Mm, yeah, don't forget to look under those nappies. That's fair. Some other things, have a quick feel of the tummy. Um, is it is it soft? Is there any obvious tenderness? Are there any obvious masses or organomegaly? So they've got a big liver, a big spleen. Hernias as well, so check your hernia sites again in the nappy area. Make sure there's nothing, there's no obvious femoral hernia or, uh, or ringal hernias. And that's quite a good way to get sight of the nappy area. Legitimately, without raising yeah. alarm bells for parents. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you have got non accidental injury and you've mm. got a pet. Both sets of parents there, one might be more dominant than the other and mm. can help you negotiate a tricky situation. Mm. And I suppose the other thing really when we're talking about exposure, particularly for kids, uh, is the ENT examination. So lots of viral infections originate from the ears, nose or throat. Um, so make sure you're having a look with it, with the otoscope in, in both ears. Uh, make sure you're having a look at the throat, having a look around the nose. I don't tend to look up the nose because I find it a little bit. Pointless and distressing, but oh, he's you suddenly lost that friendship you had with that child. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The one thing I would say, I always leave that to the end. Yeah. So your throat exam, you're going to have to restrain most children. Realistically, you're going to have to put, get the parent to put one arm across both of their arms, the other arm on their head firmly. You're going to need a tongue depressor. Get that in there. Almost make them gag because then you get a good look at good look at the tonsils. That's going to make kids cry and not like you anymore. Mm. That's okay, but unfortunately, you need to do that, particularly if they're pyrexia and looking for a, for a source. It is in their best interest, ultimately. <laughs> I often say to parents before I was in the throat is, don't be worried if your child cries, that will actually give me a really good view of the back of their throat. Mm. Yeah, it's and then the parent is more relaxed with the child. Mm. So they know that I'm expecting that the child might cry. So. to summarise some of our key learning points. I think it's really important that we recognise a seriously unwell child early and that way we can prevent hopefully the majority of carrying respiratory arrests, reducing morbidity and mortality, which is what we want. Also important to remember that most arrests, if they do get to that point in children, are generally a respiratory cause rather than a cardiac cause as we see in adults. Use our structured A to E approach because that can help you to ensure that potentially life-threatening problems that are identified early and dealt with in order of priority. Communication with your child and parents is really key for your approach to the sick child. Don't forget your safeguarding spider senses. And don't be afraid to ask for senior input early. I think that's something that we've really been stressing today. 
remember that children can come and stay for a really long time and then deteriorate quickly. So be aware of early warning signs and pay close attention to worried parents. On the bright side, it's not all awful. Children generally do bounce back quickly and they can be up playing, running around and causing trouble again very quickly. And they've often recovered before you have as a clinician. You're still really <laughs> worried about them and they're sort of bouncing off the walls. That's again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, lovely. I hope that was helpful. Um, if you do want some more stuff on paediatrics, obviously drop us an email. We do have the uh, Fever in Under Fives video and podcast that are available and also the Paediatric Spiritual Illness. So feel free.